If you understand, one of the things I like to do when I'm teaching is I like to talk about workflow, and I like to talk about efficiency, and I like to talk about preferences. So let's look a little bit at some of the Photoshop preferences. Now, we won't cover them all. We'll actually cover some of them when we get to the part where we need to use them, and that'll make it more relevant to what we're talking about. But there are a few I think we need to set up up front. If you're working in Windows, you go to the word Edit on the pull-down menu, and you'll see Preferences near the bottom of this list. If you're on a Mac, as I currently am, you can go to the word Photoshop, go to Preferences. Let's start with General. Now, the shortcut is Control-K if you want to use that. A couple of things up here real quick. We have a new image interpolation method called Bicubic Automatic. What does that exactly do? Well, anytime you resize a document in Adobe Photoshop, what you're doing to the image is you're adding or subtracting pixels. Photoshop has to figure out the best way to put it together for you. And you can see you've got smooth, best for enlargement, best for reduction. You've got a lot of different ones up here. And so a lot of times, if I'm doing a lot of enlargement, and we can change this in other places, you know, I'll make a change here. I'll change it Well, I'm going to enlarge things so it's best for enlargement. If you choose Bicubic Automatic, it tries to make that decision for you, which is not bad. I would suggest, unless you've got a specific reason to use one of the other ones, Bicubic Automatic is probably the best one to use, and it is the default. So we'll go ahead and leave it there. Auto Update Open Documents. That's a new feature. And what's that do? Well, let's say you're working on an image in Adobe Photoshop, and you're also working on that same image, you can do this at the same time in another program, and you make an update to it in the other program. When you reaccess Photoshop, it will reread the change and apply the changes. That one by default is not on. I usually won't turn that one on unless I think there's a specific reason why I need to update automatically. Beep when done, I would suggest turn off just for your own sanity. It's kind of annoying. What it does is it beeps every time a command is completed. If you want it, that's fine, but I find that a little bit annoying, so I usually turn that one off. I will turn this one off, and that's a default. What's it do? Well, let's say that you're working in Adobe Photoshop on a document. You make a copy of a piece out of that image. You then close Photoshop down. So we did an edit copy. You close Photoshop down, you open another program, and you do an edit paste, and that Photoshop clipboard data will still be there. Now, there are a lot of reasons why you probably shouldn't do that. For example, anytime you move an image through the clipboard, you're actually moving the image through the color space of the clipboard, and it will change the color. There's a lot of reasons. If I'm going to actually do that, I'll save it as a TIFF or maybe as a PSD, and then open that TIFF or PSD in the other program. So I don't usually leave that one on. But the reason I don't is not just because I don't export. If you leave it on, it leaves that information in your clipboard when you close Photoshop down. It doesn't purge it. And now your clipboard's got a lot of stuff in it, slowing everything down. So I'd say probably it's best to leave that one off. I like this one. Zoom clicked point to center. So when I'm using my zoom tool, it clicks and it moves to the center of where I clicked. This one is really cool. Very round brush hardness based on HUD, heads up display vertical movement. I got to show you that one. Okay, we're in Photoshop, and I have a brush tool selected, and I'm painting. You know, we do that all day long. I want to change the brush size. I can come up here, this little button right there, and if I click it, it gives me all the information I need to change the brush size. I can, for example, come in here and use the left and right bracket keys to change the brush size, and I can use the shift key with the left and right bracket keys to change the hardness of the brush, but here's the new shortcut. You've got a brush, don't like the size. Reach over on your keyboard and hold down the control and option keys before you begin painting. Now begin to paint. What you get is like a little red circle, doesn't matter what the color you're using is, and you get a little what's called a rich cursor come up telling you that the diameter is 175, the hardness is 44, opacity is 100%. If you drag now left or right, while you're holding those two keys down, it will change the size for you automatically. And that's not all. If you move up and down, it will change the feathering of the brush from harsh to completely feathered. Up, down, left, or right. You let go of the keys, click on the screen, you're ready to paint again. I find that one kind of fun. And I'm a big believer in shortcuts on getting things done faster. So remember you've got that one. Let's get back to preferences. In the interface itself, let's just look at one or two things here. 
you can change the color theme. I've been working with Photoshop for well over 20 years and somebody corrected me the other day. The program itself, primarily in the public eye, has been out there for about 21 years. But the program, as it existed before Photoshop bought it, if you add that time in, Photoshop's been on the planet for something like 23 years, which is pretty amazing. This is the first major change to the interface itself. And what Adobe is saying here is, we're going to let you concentrate on the image and not make the thing so cute. And I do like that. And we can change that to, well, whatever we want. We'll talk about some of this other stuff down here later. But I would suggest this one, if you've mastered the program, to go ahead and turn that off. And what that does is when you hover over something, it tells you what it is. If you're pretty comfortable with the program, I don't really think that's necessary. You could go ahead and turn that off. Just want to show you two new things in file handling. And that is save in background and automatically save recovery information every, well, X number of minutes. The save in background is really nice. When you press save on a large document, it can take, well, it can take a long time sometimes to save it. And you see the progress bar going across. It now saves in the background and allows you to work. I think that's pretty cool. But this one is really neat. When I was working on the beta for Photoshop 6, we had a lot of twitchy problems and it would crash on me every once in a while and I'd have to restart it. Well, my first thought was, well, I'll have to start all over again because I didn't really save that file. What I found out when I reopened Photoshop, the image was right there, right in front of me. It was called a recovered file and I was ready to work all over again. I do like being able to do that. One more area, and that's performance. In performance, we have scratch disk and RAM memory. Now I've got available here 74, 64 megabytes of RAM. The ideal range is here, so I'm in the ideal range. If you're not and you can afford it, you can move this slider here to increase the amount of RAM or decrease it. But heed this warning. Don't ever take that to 100%. Photoshop doesn't like to share. What that's going to do is probably hurt a lot of your other programs. The other area, and this is the way it will look default, and you would see different hard drives. These are hard drives that are on my computer. What I usually do is turn on as many of these as I think I can spare, and I usually turn off the main hard drive. My Lion hard drive is what Photoshop is working on. What does this do? It can speed your system up on large files by up to 20%, because you're giving Photoshop more disk space, scratch disk, to work on images. And I'm freeing up the main drive so it can maintain the operating system and the program. I'm kind of splitting the workload here. I think that's a pretty good thing to set up. If you have more than one hard drive, that's a pretty good thing to do. Now over here, it is detecting my graphics processor. You're going to see in Photoshop CS6 a tremendous speed increase in processing graphic images. For example, if you use Liquify, we were always waiting for Liquify to catch up with us. Not anymore. It's gotten faster. So if you have a processor, and you probably do, make sure that this is checked so it will actually use it. Now up here, I'll mention this real quick, and that's history in cache. History states is at 20, but you can change that to 1,000. That's how many undos you have. Understand the more undos you have, eventually it will begin slowing down the system a little bit. I don't think you need 1,000. What you need if you've got a thousand is another cup of coffee because you're not paying attention to what you're doing. 20 to me is okay. That's the default. And sometimes I feel like, oh, well, maybe I should put that up to 40. and It's no big deal. But you change that to what you want. Cache levels are, in a sense, redraw levels of the screen. Now, you've got a default button here, tall and thin, and big and flat. What does that mean? Well, if I click tall and thin, my cache levels... And my tile size change, if I go big and flat, it does the same thing. It changes. What are we doing here? Tall and thin. Do you work on a lot of images that are not really huge in terms of file size, but have a lot of layers? It's saying this is the best cache and tile size for tall and thin. If you work big and flat, it's saying do you work on huge images, gigabyte kind of images, but they don't have a lot of layers, this would be better for you. Now, it's up to you to choose, obviously. We'll go ahead and put that back on default for now. Now, we have a lot of other things to look at, but like I said, we'll talk about type when we get into type. We'll talk about 3D stuff when we get into 3D stuff, and it'll make it more relevant to what we're doing. But preferences in this program are a very important part to making the program look the way you want it to look, 
and to be fast enough for you so you can maintain your creative edge. On to the next.